Welcome, on behalf of MIT Sloan School of Management, to this uh, presentation in the Dean's Innovative Leader Series. It's a great honor to be able to introduce U.S. Secretary of Labor, Thomas Perez. President Obama has described Secretary Perez as the embodiment of the American dream and an energetic warrior on its behalf. Thomas Perez was born of uh, immigrant Dominican parents in Buffalo, New York. He had the opportunity to study at Brown University for a bachelor's degree and then at Harvard for a master's and PhD as a result of scholarship aid, Pell Grants, um, a great deal of hard work on his own, uh, working in the dining uh, activities, uh, working in a warehouse, working uh, as a garbage collector. After Harvard, uh, his uh, career had uh, a number of uh, interesting uh, uh, twists and turns and developments. He served as a professor at Georgetown University School, uh, sorry, at uh, University of Maryland School of Law. Um, he served for the uh, state of Mar Maryland as Secretary of Labor, uh, um, Licensing, licensing. I knew I was going to mess up licensing. <laughs> licensing and regulation. Um, he uh, served as uh, Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights in the Department of Justice. Um, and as Secretary of Labor, he has set as major goals ensuring that working American families have opportunities to move ahead and that a middle class life is available to those who are willing to work hard. It is really a great honor to welcome Thomas Perez here this afternoon. Please do so. Thank you, Dean. <laughs> thank you. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, Dean, thank you for your kind words. And I want to state the obvious. Uh, Tom and Zainab are two of my favorite people. They are wonderful ambassadors for MIT. They have helped us uh, in our work of building an economy that works for everyone. And if you don't know them well, get to know them or else it's your fault. Because uh, they're great people, incredibly accessible, and incredibly helpful. Uh, you know, I've got 269 days till the weekend, okay? I got a little thing on my desk, on my computer, on my calendar, okay? It says, how many days left? And it's not because I want to count the days, it's because I want to make the days count. Uh, and I truly believe that it's so important to make the days count. And one of the things that I have decided in terms of time management, which is the most precious asset we have in the remaining 269 days, is to figure out where to do, what to do, what to, what to do, where to go. And the reason why I have been spending a lot of time in business schools is because I am going to talk to you about you know, a couple truths that I observe about the economy. And uh, when we get to the unfinished business part of this, uh, I'm here today because I think that you are at the forefront of the unfinished business of America, building an economy that works for everyone, rejecting false choices that suggest that we can only take care of our shareholder or our worker or our customer. You can be at that forefront, building inclusive capitalism. And so I uh, have met so many business leaders who are doing it, I've met so many uh, professors who are writing about it and are demonstrating that we can create win-win solutions and uh, make sure that the rising tides lift all the boats and not just the yachts. And so that's why I'm excited to be here today. Because one thing that I have learned uh, in this job is that the unfinished business that we're going to discuss, uh, we can get there. And there's nothing inevitable, though, about our getting there. You know, Dr. King once said that justice does not roll in on wheels of inevitability. And uh, we have a lot of choices here to be making. And what you're teaching, Tom and Zainab, is that uh, we can make a choice to build an economy that works for everyone. And in making that choice to choose the high road, the high road is indeed the smart road. And it's a smart road for your shareholders. It's a smart road for your workers. It's a smart road for your customers. It's a smart road for your supply chain. And that's what it's all about. And so that's what I want to do. I really want to talk to you about some business leaders who have responded to these tough choices in remarkable ways. 
because uh, you are those business leaders of tomorrow. So if I can get a few of you uh, to be uh, practicing uh, what Tom and Zainab have been researching and, talking and, and teaching us, that would be remarkable. And, and this is what the president said this year about inclusive capitalism in the State of the Union. He said, this year I plan to lift up the many businesses who figured out that doing right by their workers or their customers or their communities ends up being good for our shareholders. And I want to spread those best practices across America because that's part of a brighter future. That's what the president said. And I could not agree with him more. And, and let me, as we talk about spreading this gospel, I think it's important to level set where we are. And, and I think there are two truths about our economy. There may be more than two, but there's two we can discuss today. Truth number one is, you know, when the president got in office, we were in the biggest ditch of our lifetime. In the three months before the president took office, the economy hemorrhaged uh, roughly 2.4 million jobs. First time claims for unemployment benefits were at over 600,000 per week, per week. Uh, the auto industry was on life support, and as you know, there were a number of folks who said, pull the plug, let it die, let it sink or swim. The unemployment rate was approaching 10%. There were roughly seven job seekers for every job opening in the depths of the Great Recession. Now look at where we are now. We have an unemployment rate of 5%. It's been cut in half. We've had 73 straight months in a row of private sector job growth to the tune of over 14 million jobs. That's the longest streak on record. We now have about 1.4 job seekers for every job opening. And at business schools, you're pretty good at math. At law schools, we're not. But I don't think I need to be a math major to figure out I'd rather compete against one person for a job than against six people for a job. Last week, first-time claims for unemployment were 247,000, which is the lowest number we have had since November of 1973. Virtually none of you in this room were on the planet November of 1973. Maybe Tom and me. Uh, Zainab wasn't. Um, and uh, well, we won't go there. Uh, and you know what? We've now had 59 weeks in a row below 300,000. And that's the longest streak since the mid-70s. So we've made a lot of progress. The auto industry had its best year ever last year, capping a six-year period that's the best period since uh, uh, the end of World War II. So we're indeed making uh, real progress. And we're making critical investments in skills and other things so that people are equipped for the jobs of the 21st century. We're making critical investments in apprenticeship because apprenticeship uh, for many is the other college, um, except without the debt. And so we're making these investments. And so that's truth number one, which was, uh, you know, we inherited a mess and we've come a long way. But you know what? Truth number two is that we still have a long way to go. And all you have to do is watch the campaign out there to see the angst that people feel, whether you're Democrat, Republican, independent, unaffiliated, whatever you are. The economy is out of balance. We used to see... Uh, for decades after World War II, productivity and wage growth would go hand in hand. So when you were helping to bake that pie of prosperity as a worker, you were sharing in that spoils of that prosperity. And then around 1980 or so, that started to break away. You'd see uh, productivity growth, but it wasn't matched by similar wage growth. We see the decline of labor union density. We saw a number of other factors. And, and so the reality of today is, while we've made a lot of progress, I met a woman recently uh, in the Fight for 15 movement in Detroit, a uh, fast food worker, working her tail off to feed her three children. And the night before I met her, she slept in her car. We can do better than that as a nation. I meet all too many people like that, making choices. The person I met in Connecticut who said, I decide between a gallon of milk and a gallon of gas every single week. We can do better than that as a nation. And so we have these challenges. We need to make sure that uh, the rising tide, as I said earlier, lifts all the boats and not just the yachts. And the Wall Street bonus pool in 2014 was $28.5 billion with a B. And that's roughly twice as much as all full-time minimum wage earners earned in the United States. Most, roughly twice as much. 
So we have a lot of work to do. And the unfinished business of this recovery is ensuring shared prosperity. And we're doing a lot of things to make sure that this rising tide lifts all boats. Things like the minimum wage, our investments in skills, our investments in apprenticeship, making sure we reward businesses that are insourcing as opposed to outsourcing. All of those things are very, very important. But sometimes I hear people say things like, these are structural problems and with technology and globalization, you know, the only way to survive in the United States is low wages and economic inequality. And I will be honest with you, I don't buy that. When I think of the term structural problems, you know, for me, that all too frequently amounts to excuse making, a way to justify inertia and gridlock, to avoid bold decisions, and to avoid strong creative leadership. Because that's what you are in this room. You are leaders. And you know what? I have learned. I've learned from Zainab. I've learned from Tom. I've learned from doing house calls in this job. And I make a lot of house calls in this job. And I have learned from the remarkable business leaders that I make, that I meet, that there is a movement across this country, companies large and small who understand that the high road is the smart road. And they believe that investing in their workers is the best way to grow the bottom line. I, I have an Ace Hardware store that's a mile from my office. And uh, the owner, she owns seven Ace Hardware stores. She's paid their, her workers above the minimum wage. She has little or no attrition. And she has a remarkably loyal workforce. And she tells me all the time, you know what? Uh, one of the biggest costs any business owner has is the cost of training new workers. And I seldom have to incur that cost because I have paid my workers more. And so we see that uh, these higher retention rates and lower training and turnover costs are good for business. There was a guy named Henry Ford you may have heard of who figured that one out over 100 years ago when he doubled the wages for people on the assembly line because he understood basic principles of macroeconomics. Consumption is 70% of GDP. And what I hear most frequently when I talk to employers today is when I ask the question, what can we do to help? They tell me, I need more customers. But you know what? If you're making seven and a quarter an hour, you can't consume because you don't have any money in your pocket. And so people like Henry Ford understood that if people are going to be able to afford my product, I need to double the wages of people on the assembly line. And by the way, if I want to reduce um, attrition, and he, was, he had attrition rates over 300%, try running a business when you have that kind of attrition. And so I've met people across this country. I met a woman named Andra Rush in Detroit. Uh, she is a remarkable woman. She started a company called Detroit Manufacturing Systems. And she went from zero employees to 1,200 employees. In a little over a year, we helped her. We were match.com for her. You know, we matched, we're, we're at the Department of Labor, we match job seekers who want to punch their ticket to the middle class with businesses that want to grow their business. And Andrea Rush is now one of the um, uh, suppliers to Ford Motor Company of the console for the F-150 pickup truck, the largest, the best-selling pickup truck in the world and has been for the last 30 years. This is not an ad for Ford. This is just making a statement of fact. And, and so she has built in the city of Detroit, a thriving business with the workforce in the neighborhood. She understands that zip code should never determine destiny. She understands that everyone's entitled to a second chance. So a number of her workers have criminal records. The largest private employer in the state of Maryland is Johns Hopkins Hospital. The most prolific employer of former offenders is Johns Hopkins. And if Ron Peterson, the head of Hopkins Hospital, were here, he would tell you that this is an act of enlightened self-interest that our workers who have a criminal history are our most loyal workers, and they're phlebotomists, they're x-ray techs, they're doing everything across the food chain of Hopkins. And by the way, Hopkins is a pretty good school, and they're doing pretty good work. And so they recognize that you can build an ecosystem within your company that creates shared prosperity. When I spoke at the University of Colorado recently, I was with the folks from New Belgium Brewery. I like to have a microbrew or two, and I encourage you to get New Belgium because you know what? They have a profit-sharing plan. She created an ESOP, and you know what? The democratic culture that exists there is remarkable, and they're going gangbusters. They're, I think, now the third largest U.S. 
uh, based brewery uh, around. Uh, Jim Cook of um, uh, Sam Adams and uh, JP is the, is the top base. And so they understand that when you put your workers at the center of attention, it creates shared prosperity for everyone. And if you've read the paper in the last 24 hours and you eat yogurt, I advise you to go get some Chobani because you may have read what the CEO there did yesterday when he um, announced that workers would receive shares worth up to 10% of the company when it goes public or is sold. And that ain't pocket change, my friends, as you know. And uh, why did he do that? Because he said, the reason why I have been able to grow my business is because of my workers. And when workers have skin in the game, it works for everyone. I recall the work we did together with you to tell the story of Market Basket, and you know that story. And that's a remarkable example. That's a non-union shop. We have many examples of worker voice in the labor management context. And I believe that one of the best things that we could do to increase shared prosperity is to increase union density because collective bargaining has been one of the most important forces to create a thriving middle class in our nation's history. And we highlight all the time at the White House union management partnerships, whether it's uh, Kaiser Permanente and their labor unions who've worked together to make sure that we lower costs for health care, that we um, address patient safety issues, and we pay our workers a decent wage. They've built that culture through collective bargaining of collaboration. There's a different model used at uh, Market Basket, but it's a, market, it's a model of building corporate culture that, as you know, was equally effective. And so we see example after example. And, and recently at the White House, Zainab helped facilitate a meeting uh, with myself and Kip Tyndall. Kip is the CEO of the Container Store, a publicly traded company and always on Forbes' list of best places to work in America. He has built a culture of inclusion, a culture in which workers are at the center of attention. And he's figured out how to do good and do well. And he recommended a book to me, which I recommend to you, in addition to Zainab's. It's called Firms of Endearment, How World-Class Companies Profit from Passion and Purpose. And you see case study after case study showing that what we're talking about today, the rejection of false choices, the building of models where we have stakeholder models of governance rather than the genuflect on the altar of quarterly earnings model of governance. And you see so many examples, one of which, for instance, uh, the CEO of Southwest Airlines, who says, and I quote, we focus on corporate culture more than anything else we do. We are a big company now. We really focus on developing local leaders. We try to have people at every station who understand our corporate culture, who value it, and who share it with other employees. And by the way, folks, Southwest Airlines has been the most profitable domestic carrier over the last, I think, 15 or 20 years, including through the Great Recession. And by the way, you know, when I was a kid growing up, Baggage handlers were middle-class jobs, but now so many legacy carriers, in an effort to cut corners, a short-sighted effort to cut corners, have contracted those jobs out. So if you go to Newark Airport, and I'm not gonna name names of airlines, there's only like three legacy airlines left. I don't think I need to name names. You'll see those uh, baggage handlers and they're making the minimum wage, and I met them. And they tell me, you know what, my kid just turned 14 years old and I can't get him a birthday present. The dignity of work is about paying someone a fair wage. That's what the Fair Labor Standards Act is about. That's what our nation is about. We're supposed to reward hard work. That's what Southwest Airlines does because baggage handlers at Southwest Airlines are middle-class jobs. You don't have to make your baggage handlers minimum wage jobs in order to survive. That's a choice. That was not an inevitability. And that's the point of today. That's the point of what Tom and Zainab do for a living. These are choices. And when you have leaders, you can exercise the right choices. And this is also, let me be clear, what they're doing at Southwest Airlines, what they're doing at Shabani, what they're doing at Shake Shack. You got Shake Shack here in Boston yet? Okay, do me a favor now. Don't tell the first lady what I'm about to say. <laughs> Shake Shack has awesome stuff. Okay? Especially the milkshakes, okay? But please don't tell her I said that. And one of the best IPOs over the last two years has been Shake Shack. 
And you talk to Danny Meyer, which I have, and I talk to him frequently, the founder of Shake Shack. He was just down in D.C. meeting with all of his managers of the Shake Shack stores. And he said to them, you know what? When I was coming into the D.C. market, I was told that this was going to be a failure because it would be hard to make it work here. We had saturation. And it's their best performing market or one of their best performing markets. What was the secret to success? Answer. We paid our workers well above the minimum wage. We incented them with monthly bonuses depending on performance. And we are kicking butt. And this is a publicly traded company with those sorts of values. So this can be done, my friends. These companies are shattering, as I've noted a number of times, all the false choices that we have been indoctrinated with all these years. You know, quarterly earnings are the raison d'etre. You know, high wages will undermine competitiveness. Unionization will stunt economic growth. Vigilance about worker safety or environmental stewardship is bad for business. It'll cost us money. That the only priority is that quarter-to-quarter -quarter earnings vortex. Because we have seen, and the research has documented, advancing a shared prosperity agenda is the way to build an economy that works for, indeed, everybody. And, and government must be a catalytic force. And that is why the president held the Worker Voice Summit. That's why we're using our convening authority to be a catalytic force. That's why we're highlighting businesses that are doing the right thing. But you know what? I'm, I was born at night, but I wasn't born last night. And not everyone believes in conscious capitalism. You know, there are still some folks out there who believe that if I can, you know, cut this corner here and cut this corner there, that uh, that's the way to do it. Um, if you watch this election cycle, that's not the way to do it. That's, no long, that's not only not good for your business, that is not good for our politics, and that's not good for our nation. And that is why you see so much angst on the left and on the right. And I know there are continued interests who, you know, I think some folks feel that the Gilded Age was a golden age for our nation. I don't agree with that. I think we need to continue to move. There's some folks who feel like if I blow out your neighbor, my neighbor's candle, that's going to make my candle shine brighter. So, you know, if you, have a, if you have a pension, my neighbor, then my job is to make sure you don't have a pension. Well, you know what? If you have a pension and I don't, I've got another strategy for you. Why don't we work to make sure that you both have a pension? That might be a better way to build shared prosperity. And so that's why we see the president doing everything he can. We're, we're talking all the time about the minimum wage. We now have 60 million people in this country as a result of state and local actions who live in jurisdictions that are marching to fight for 15. Now, $15 an hour two years ago, people would have been laughing at that. But you know what? It's no laughing matter when you've got to work 50 hours a week and get your food at the food pantry. And so we see that movement. We see the movement to make college more affordable because the word educational mortgage uh, should be removed from our lexicon. I have a feeling I'm resonating with a few folks in this room <laughs> because uh, I remember that well. And that is why we're doing all that we can do as a government. But here's the bottom line. We can't do this alone. We need to make sure that everybody's doing their part. We need to make sure that we take the Kip Tyndalls of the world and the Danny Myers of the world and we scale them up. We need to make sure that they're the rule and not the exception. And that's what we need to do. And there was a guy that uh, I never had the privilege of meeting, but uh, I've always had a great admiration for. And his name was Leon Sullivan. He was a um, Philadelphia-based uh, Baptist minister and a civil rights leader. And in the early 70s, he was appointed to the board of General Motors, the first African-American to be appointed to the board of a, a major company in America. And he used that tremendous platform to do a lot of good, to bring about change uh, in the anti-apartheid movement, for instance, in South Africa. And he developed a set, uh, a set of principles that uh, were aptly called the Sullivan Principles, a simple code of conduct for companies and nations where they do business. And they included equal pay, non-segregation, training opportunities, quality of life and housing, education and health and the like. And those principles were catalytic for divestment. Those principles were subsequently and eventually um, adopted by the um, United Nations. And, and as I've been thinking about the unfinished business of building an economy that works for everybody, 
and this stakeholder model of governance, inclusive capitalism, all sorts of different terms, I have been thinking about, you know, maybe we need a Sullivan principles uh, for shared prosperity. And, 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 you know, I've been thinking about this, and, and I, I've come up with a few, and I have a feeling you may agree with some, and I have a feeling you may disagree with some, and I also have a feeling you might have a few more to add. But these are the ones that I've come up with, and I, I bring them for your discussion, and then I'm going to leave you with a homework assignment. I'm sorry to say that, but I used to teach, and I want to give you a homework assignment. And principle number one is something that you've heard me say already, which is that we need to reject false choices. We need to reject false choices that suggest that you either take care of your shareholders or your customers. You know, I used to do a lot of police work. Um, I was working at the Department of Justice in 1992, almost 24 years ago to the day when the riots occurred in Los Angeles. I had prosecuted a, a LAPD officer about a year before L, uh, Rodney King, and um, I saw a culture in that department, bless you, uh, bless all of you, that uh, was in desperate need of uh, reform. And, and there's this false choice that you see, whether it was in LA, whether it's in Ferguson, whether it's in Chicago, wherever, that, that suggests that it's either got to be safe streets or respect for the Constitution. When I was doing fair lending work, you know, I'd hear, you know, you either, uh, you either have a, a sound climate for lending or you have stifling regulations. And we learned in the uh, height of the uh, housing bubble that that is bogus. That's a false choice. So we live in a world of false choices. So principle number one is we've got to reject these false choices. I remember a Fortune 50 CEO telling me that the quarter-to-quarter -quarter results vortex is one of the biggest forces that makes them have to think short-term at the expense of long-term thinking. So we need to do that. Principle number two is a timeless principle in this country. If you work a full-time job in America, you shouldn't have to live in poverty. You ought to be able to feed your family. You ought to be able to have a roof over your head, access to affordable health care, and a little nest egg so that you can retire with dignity. Principle number three, worker voice is essential to business competitiveness, and all of your employees deserve a meaningful say. I've, I've seen time and time again in the workforce at the Department of Labor, I haven't had an original idea in years. But I pride myself in spending a lot of time listening to our workforce. And I'm proud of the fact that in the last two years, when you do employee viewpoint surveys at the Department of Labor, the agency that has moved up the most in employee satisfaction has been the Department of Labor. Again, I'm not embarrassed to tell you that I don't have many original ideas except the original idea of being a good listener and making sure workers have skin in the game. Now, there are many ways to provide skin in the game. I'm a big fan of collective bargaining, but that's not the only way. And we can do so many different ways. Pick one, but make sure that worker voice is part of that ethic. Principle number four, if you believe that family comes first, I hope you'll put it in practice and not simply pay lip service to it. We're the only nation in the industrialized world that doesn't have some form of federal paid leave. Now, many of you may decide in life that you want to have a family, and you should never be choosing between the family that you love and the job that you need. And it's embarrassing that we're the only nation in the country. And I used to talk about the United States and Papua New Guinea until someone stopped me afterward and said, Papua New Guinea is about to change their law. Stop dissing Papua New Guinea. So I'm no longer going to diss Papua New Guinea. But I will say this. We live in a modern family world, and we've got to stop using our leave it a beaver framework because it's keeping women out of the workplace. It's keeping all too many families uh, in a situation where they can't make ends meet and shame on us for doing that. And uh, you know, later today, we're gonna talk about this issue here in Massachusetts, the issue of paid leave because the president's trying to do something but we have a recalcitrant con Congress. I'm glad y'all were sitting down when I said that. And so we're going state by state, locality by locality uh, to make sure that we can move forward. Uh, principle number five, and, and Sloan embodies this, innovation is indeed America's middle name, and innovation is always going to drive our success in the business world. And for me, at the same time, the key to long-term success is inclusive 
innovation that benefits everyone. And this principle is important because we're having a lot of conversation about the future of work, the so-called uh, gig economy. And I always say, and I've been a part of many conversations, that we applaud innovation. We don't ever shy away from innovation. It is our middle name. But you know what? It can never be an excuse to say, I'm sorry, the only way I can innovate is to give you no protections. That's not sustainable innovation, and it doesn't need to be that way. And we have so many examples of inclusive innovation that have been the lifeblood of our country. And principle number six, successful businesses believe in diversity. I was out in Silicon Valley recently, and one business owner said, you know, we, do, we, we practice what we preach on diversity um, because it's smart not because it's PC. And you know, I teach my kids, you know, I want you to tolerate Brussels sprouts. I want you to embrace diversity. We live in a remarkably diverse community and my kids are ready for the world. Some people are still processing Brussels sprouts. <laughs> didn't, didn't flow, I, I get it, okay. But you know what? Um, I, I see your website, and this is what you say. MIT Sloan welcomes and celebrates diverse viewpoints, creating an environment where new ideas grow and thrive. The connection among students, faculty, and staff at MIT Sloan and MIT foster creative thinking and rigorous debate. And when the um, affirmative action cases were argued in 2004, the Grutter cases, that was the case at the time that generated the most amicus briefs in the history of the court. It's been since eclipsed by the Affordable Care Act. But you know what? The entities that filed the most amicus briefs in that case were Fortune 500 companies who understood the value of diversity as part of their bottom line. If you want to be a company with a global footprint, or if you're a small business going to emerging markets, if you don't have a racially diverse and culturally competent workforce, you will not succeed. And that leads me really to my last principle, which is a principle I heard from um, the president a year ago. And that is, uh, a year or so ago, we got to go down to uh, Selma to um, celebrate the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday. Um, I'm a civil rights lawyer as well as a labor lawyer, and, I, and also a trial lawyer, so I, I wander sometimes. So you'll excuse me for wandering. And um, you know, the president said uh, at Sloan the following, which is, the most important word in a democracy, and I will expand upon this to say the most important word in a democracy and the most important word for an effective business is the simple two-letter word, we. Selma was about, and the Voting Rights Act and the, the whole civil rights movement was about ordinary people who did extraordinary things. It was about marshalling the power of we. And when I see the remarkable work that so many businesses are doing to build shared prosperity. When the Ford Motor Company was at an existential crisis in, um, the, in 2009, and I own a Ford Escape, and I went down to um, Louisville, Kentucky, where it's manufactured. You know, back then, they were down to like 800 workers. They weren't sure they were going to stay open. And so they came together, workers and management, around a vision of shared sacrifice that would lead to shared prosperity. They now have 4,500 workers at that plant, not including their supply chain, because they understood that we all succeed when we all succeed. And that's what this is all about. Because you know, when we only focus on me instead of we, whether it's our democracy or whether it's our business, that's not who we are as a nation. And that is the unfinished business, it seems to me of America, and, and I told you I was gonna give you homework, and so this is it. This is an assignment I used to give to my students, uh, the second last class when I was teaching, and that was this, to write your own obituary. Now why did I do that? That seems a little macabre, and it is. But what I wanted to get them to do, and they don't do it often enough, was to reflect, what do you want your legacy to be, you know? Um, if you ever get to see the uh, show Hamilton on Broadway, totally recommend it, okay? Why is he talking about that? Um, at the end of it, after he's been shot, Alexander Hamilton uh, says, you know, he, he's about to die, and he says, legacy, what is a legacy? Legacy is planting seeds in a garden that you never see. You have an opportunity in your lifetime 
to plant seeds that you will see and some that you will not see. Because you know what? I am looking at tomorrow's leaders. And all of the challenges we have today of economic inequality, I think the most important thing that we can do is summon our values and summon leadership and, and expand on those Sullivan principles or develop new ones so that we can marshal the collective power of we and build an economy that works for everyone. Zainab and Tom have shown that this is not corporate social responsibility. This is enlightened self-interest. But we've got to scale what they're showing in their research. And the reason why in one of my 269 days I want to spend time with you is because I'm hoping that some of you are going to do just that. And then when you write your obituary, you know, people are going to say, you know, like they would say about Andrew Rush in uh, Detroit, she not only grew a business, uh, she gave hope to folks. She, she wasn't just building a console for the Ford F-150, she was building the middle class. What's better than that? To be able to be part of what we are, which is, you know, and again, um, you know, uh, Alexander Hamilton says, you know, America, this great unfinished symphony. And that's really what the Constitution says, you know. We the people in order to form a more perfect union. We keep doing it, but we keep having unfinished business, and we always will. And you're at the center of our unfinished business. You have a tremendous amount of opportunity to help fashion that great unfinished symphony into an orchestra because we may place different instruments. I work in government. Some of you may come to work for government. Some of you may go into uh, business or whatever you will do. But we're in, we're, we're, we, so we'll play different instruments, but we're, we're part of that same orchestra. And it's an orchestra of opportunity. And we got to make sure that the orchestra has as many players as possible. So that's why I'm going to business schools because I'm getting old. You know, I got a replacement part now. I got no hair, you know, and so I need your help. I quite frankly need your help. And I need you to help us build and scale what we know works. And we know it not only uh, through uh, the work of Tom and Zainab, but through the work of so many other uh, scholars and equally importantly, through the experiences of the Southwest Airlines of the world, through the experiences of Costco, through the experiences of uh, the Ace Hardware Store, uh, near me, Lo small businesses, large businesses, businesses in between. This model works for everyone, but you've got to make the choice that that's how you want to lead. And I hope you will make that choice. And with that, I'm more than willing to take any questions you might have. Thank you very much. And, and I got to ask one question. Is that Bethesda Chevy Chase? Yeah, gum it. Okay, thank you. My son's a baseball player. I noticed your BCC shirt. Okay. Uh, yes, I just wanted to ask a question. Uh, you mentioned the benefits of workers having skin in the game. Uh, what did that look like for, or what do you think that looks like for government workers? And how did you apply that in the Department of Labor? Sure. Um, there's two dimensions to that answer. Um, there was a case that was just heard in the Supreme Court. Uh, Fredericks uh, is the case. It involves uh, uh, basically it's it, it's an assault on public sector labor unions, and uh, uh, and and what the case wasn't about. Let me be clear: is uh, if a labor union, you know, your teachers union or your firefighters union or your police union, is using your dollars that you pay to uh, do political activity, you already have the right under existing law to say you can't do this. This was about uh, using your money to do collective bargaining so that they can bargain for higher wages. And there has been a very coordinated strategy. It, and it really gets to what I said before. You know, my, my neighbor has a pension and I don't. So the remedy is let's make it harder for my neighbor who has a pension to keep that pension. I think we should do the opposite approach. And, and I'm very troubled by what I see, these assaults on public sector labor unions. Because I think our teachers and firefighters and police officers uh, and uh, social workers are doing God's work. And, uh, and so that's why we've been so aggressively involved 
in trying to help them. Closer to home at the Department of Labor, you know, I think, for me, I think one of the most important things is, is really to, to listen. So, uh, you know, I, I remember doing, a, whenever someone new starts, they do these listening tours, and people roll their eyes after a while. There we go again. Um, but you got to act. So, you know, what we heard from folks were some basic things. Like, uh, you know, I'm working in the wage and hour division, and I'd really like to see what it's like to work in the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And so uh, now we have this entire thing. It's a, uh, basically um, a detail program. And you can sign up and do it for three, four months. And it's going gangbusters. And we've had like 600 people who've done it. Uh, we had to build a culture where everybody, if you're a GS3 employee making uh, whatever GS3 makes, we want to have a career ladder because we have an employment and training administration that does that for everyone else. And we need to do it for ourselves. And so it's been very heartening to see people uh, on that career ladder. Uh, we needed to build a culture of um, innovation. It's very hard to take risk in the federal government when uh, you have the gotcha oversight of uh, Capitol Hill. Uh, and so it's really incumbent on leadership to say, I got your back. Because if we don't innovate, if we don't take educated risk to make sure we can deal with the problems of the 21st century, then we're never going to be as effectual uh, as we want. And so I'm proud of the fact that we now have a diversity and inclusion council that we never had before. We have an employee engagement office. Uh, you know, we, we didn't have a policy on telecommuting. And so people, it was catch as catch can. And people perceive that, you know, if, if I'm a favorite, then I, get, then I get it. And if I'm not, I don't. So we've, we've um, taken care of a lot of those basics. And, and, you know, for me, it all comes down to this. You know, you, work, you spend a lot of time at your job. You got to like what you do. And so we're trying to create a culture where people like what they do. And you know, there's some moms who have kids who are three months old, and they didn't have a, they didn't have a place to go and nurse and stuff like that. And, and you know, just paying attention to the details and making sure that you don't walk in there with, I got all the ideas. I've never worked here before, but I know what's best for the agency. That's the most frequent mistake I've observed as a career person. And that's not a partisan comment, because I've worked for Republican and Democrats, and I've loved Republicans I've worked for, and I've loved Democrats I've worked for. I've kind of not liked Democrats I've worked for, and I've kind of not liked some Republicans I've worked for. Because these are principles that transcend party, listening, you know, and then acting. Yes? Thank you for being here. Um, Thank you you for speak a me. lot about diversity in the workplace, uh, yet the uh, unemployment rate for underrepresented minorities is two to three times the national average. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about how you can convince some of these business leaders to sure. truly see that diversity really leads to shareholder value, and how you convince some of these underrepresented communities to really have skin in the game and that they have a fair shot? Sure. A huge part of the unfinished business of America is what you've said. I mean, the, you know, the African-American unemployment rate has come down in half, but it's still like 9%. Uh, the labor force participation rate in the late 50s of young African-American men was something like 76%. It is now 37% of young African-American men. And so for me, it starts with summoning some basic principles. Number one, uh, zip code should never determine destiny. So we've spent a lot of time in Baltimore. And uh, the uh, legislature in this past session just passed a bill to bring uh, these new, very innovative six-year high school models into Baltimore City. So you come out of it with an associate's degree. Because I'd meet people at Frederick Douglass High School who'd say, you know, um, you know, I'm smart, I'm getting all A's, but there are no IEP courses. And that ain't fair. You know, I meet someone else who says, I want to be a nurse, but I don't know anyone who's a nurse. And so they've got talent, but they don't have mentors. They don't have a Rolodex. Uh, actually, I need to explain to those under 30 what a Rolodex <laughs> is. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, but, but I mean, th those are some of the basics. And so uh, we need to, we're doing a lot in apprenticeship. And I was just talking to Tom about our work in apprenticeship. Apprenticeship is a tried and true pathway to the middle class for a lot of people. But what's equally true historically about apprenticeship is it's been a white guy thing. And so we are working hard with our colleagues in labor to double down and diversify. And so we're introducing uh, apprenticeship in a number of settings. And by the way, one of the people who's led this effort uh, before he was mayor of Boston was Marty Walsh. Uh, he had pre-apprenticeship programs that were targeted at uh, young kids of color, uh, many of whom had had some involvement in the criminal justice system. And it's going gangbusters, and we've measured it. 
And so we want to make sure we're opening up those uh, lines of opportunity. When you have more paid, when you have sensible paid leave policies, you're going to provide pathways of opportunity for women in the workplace. And you know we are using our enforcement tools because there's too many companies where the glass ceiling continues to be impenetrable. And and uh, and, and so you know we're, we see progress, but you still you go to Silicon Valley and it doesn't look like America. Uh, you go to Wall Street and it doesn't look like America. You go to a lot of schools across this country and it doesn't look like America. And uh, and one of the reasons I love this job is, you know, we're all about, the My Brother's Keeper initiative is all about young men of color recognizing that there have been persistent opportunity gaps and we can't just, you know, um, uh, sweep that under the carpet. We've got to come up with targeted interventions uh, for young men of color, uh, recognizing that it is in our enlightened self-interest. We cannot just allow a generation of folks um, to go by the wayside. And we've got to address the issue of mass incarceration. And there's a bipartisan consensus around this. You know, we can't, I mean, the, the, our, some of the things we did in the past um, have had real consequences. And, and Baltimore, again, to use it as an example, one of the things we're doing there is reentry at scale and uh, addressing a lot of barriers. And one of my favorite stories ar arising out of the election uh, in Maryland yesterday was a story of a a young man in Baltimore, 25 or 26 years old, who voted for the first time because the legislature just enacted a law enabling, making it easier for folks who have paid their debt to society to vote. And if we're going to build communities like Baltimore, we've got to give people the opportunity to truly uh, dictate their own destiny. And, and disenfranchising them for life, I don't think, is sensible public policy. Thank you, Secretary Perez, for coming to speak. Over oh, there. there you are. Oh, okay. How do you see the gig economy evolving? And specifically, do you think the Department of Labor should update its definition of contract work, or do you think the courts should decide what's considered contract well, work? Well, I think the first thing it's important to do is um, the, the whole, uh, we, we did a, we did a, um, a three-day symposium on the future of work back in December. And it focused on um, a lot on the, the gig economy, the on-demand economy. Uh, and, and one of the things that I said at the outset of this is it's important to understand that uh, the, the on-demand economy is about 1% of our economy. So we don't want to, we want to appreciate that. We also want to understand that people have been doing gigs uh, forever. You know, construction workers have been uh, a quintessential gig economy for a long time. And before we can address the future of work, we need to understand you know, the past of work and appreciate some of the things we have done and haven't done. And a big part of the reason why we have seen, for instance, uh, you know, we, we, uh, productivity and wages went hand in hand for a few decades after World War II, and then we started to see that unravel. And part of the reason was the fissuring of the workplace and uh, the, the phenomenon of misclassification, where employers, uh, employ somebody as an independent contractor, but they're anything but an independent contractor. And we really haven't, you know, we have a very aggressive misclassification initiative. But uh, at the same time, you know, the, when you allow um, this to happen, it's, it's, it's not the only thing that's causing the, the uh, wage stagnation that we see, but it's one of those things. And so when I think about, uh, there have been proposals to add a third uh, I think it was dependent contractor. And the two people who wrote the piece are two very good friends of mine. And I'm, I'm appreciative of the fact that they, uh, Alan Kruger and Seth Harris, that they've um, thrown an idea out there for consideration. Um, the concern I have is uh, when you create a third category of dependent contractor, you know, are you going to create opportunities for regulatory arbitrage, as they call it in the business? So somebody who's, a, who's truly an employee, they're going to try to move them down uh, to that. And so I, I personally have more questions than answers. We, we, we periodically get complaints, and we, will, we deal with the complaints as they come in. The state of California, obviously, was doing some stuff with uh, Uber, and they recently settled that case. Uh, and what I have been, uh, we've been doing a lot of convenings on precisely the question you asked. And it's really interesting to, to sit down with these companies, managed by Q is one, that Zainab is spending some time with. Uh, and what they've done, they made a decision that uh, 
they're, they're a company out of New York City. They're now in New York, San Francisco, LA, and Chicago, I think. And they do a bunch of different logistics things from managing, from cleaning your, your, your building to managing your IT. And uh, they are employing their workers as W-2 employees because their CEO and founder has concluded that, you know, I want, I'm building this to last. I'm not building it so that I can take the venture capital coming in and then go public and then, you know, cash out. I want to be in this for the long haul. And, uh, and it's really interesting to see. They're, they're, they're doing good and they're doing well. And, and so, again, I come back to what I said before. You know, how do we build inclusive innovation? How do we build the social compact for the 21st century? I mean, in a world where people, uh, millennials, you know, go from gig to gig, that 35-year job for my dad is now 35 years, 35 gigs for the next generation. And so we've got to build a safety net because, uh, you know, the, otherwise, you know, if you're going around from gig to gig without a safety net, then the next time you get rear-ended by someone, that's your pathway to poverty. So I have more questions than answers is the short answer to your question. But we continue, and that's, you know, the social, the, the Industrial Revolution took 35 years before we got the laws in the 1930s that kind of brought this together. And, and there's a lot of activity around the country right now and a lot of conversation, and we certainly welcome the input of folks here on what the best results should be. Oh, uh, this guy had his hand up, and he was really patient, and I'm more than willing to take it, if that's okay, Dean. Thank you. I appreciate it, especially since we're at uh, technology school. Uh, how do business leaders and government leaders think about the role of technology uh, when they're making their labor decisions, especially since you know, incentivizing or paying workers more increases the business case for using technology to solve a business process rather than people, which then incentivizes more companies to create more technology solutions all while diminishing job opportunities. Sure. I mean, it's, it, uh, we've had that conversation a lot. And, and you know, it's undeniable. I grew up in Buffalo, New York, and the Bethlehem Steel Plant, which is no longer there, uh, is now being replaced by a lot of advanced manufacturing facilities that, as a result of technology, require uh, fewer employees with greater skills. And so in order to keep this going, we've got to scale this. At, at the same time, I've read a lot of research uh, that has talked about how uh, if you raise the minimum wage, you know, we're going to see a massive movement to technology. And, and uh, I've read a number of papers that have said that, you know, some of those predictions have been a little overstated uh, in reality. There will always be a role for people. Uh, and so, you know, technology and innovation generally, I mean, we're at the Department of Labor, we're not going to get more money for bodies. And so the most important way we're going to be able to keep up with our increasing workload is by making sure our human capital is happy and making sure they have uh, technology. So our, our wage and hour investigators can go out and you know, have a, you know, an iPad or some other device that enables them to not have to come back and take their scribbled notes and uh, put it on a computer. So technology will always be there. Um, but you know, at the same time, uh, I think we, we have to make sure that, you know, again, my first or second principle was if you're working a full-time job in this country, you ought to be able to feed your family. And, uh, you know, I keep hearing this. Well, you know, if you're a burger flipper, the only way to make that business model work is to pay, uh, you know, crappy wages. You know, you go out west to In-N-Out Burger, which is kind of a cult place for a lot of people who live out west. And, you know, they, they, they are going gangbusters, and they treat their workers well, and, you know, Shake Shack and others. So, you know, I, I don't fear technology. I appreciate the fact that, and, and a big part of our workforce investment is making sure that people keep up with technology. Uh, you know, when we're investing in IT workers, we the cloud is today's, uh, it's, it's today's uh, technology. It's going to be something else in five years. So what we have to do to stay ahead of technology is train people not only to deal with the cloud, but to have the acumen to adjust to whatever cloud 3.0 is. And that's what happened in my father's generation. My, my surrogate father had a seventh or had a 10th grade education. And when the economy in Buffalo hollowed out, he, he had great smarts. He was, the most, he was the wisest man I ever met. But he didn't have the hard skills uh, to adjust to what the next frontier was. 
And, um, and that had dire consequences. Uh, and, and so that's what we have to watch out for. Okay.